Hi, boys and girls. <laughs> okay. okay, welcome to Wild at Hearts raccoon medical training thing. Yes, the deal was we were supposed to actually have a, a group of people here, and somehow the group of people never made it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a question and answer session. She's asking questions. I hopefully we'll have all the answers. And then from there, we're going to play this next week. And if we have more questions, we can actually video telemedicine yeah. that as well. Um, but yeah, I'll be working next week in Long Beach, so I won't be able to handle the meeting that they've got scheduled. So anyway, we're here today, so they already have some questions set. Yep. Hit me. Okay. Get your best <laughs> shot. Oh, you mean with questions. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about distemper. Let's talk about how it's spread and how common is it in our area and amongst our, our uh, the raccoons here. Okay. Um, well, first let me say a little disclaimer. I was not all that prepared for today's speeches, but what we are going to do is, you know, just off the cuff, we're going to talk about these things. So her first question yeah. is distemper. Uh, distemper is a morbidly virus that tends to affect um, many species, most mammals, um, and morbidly viruses are unique in the fact that there are species-specific morbidly viruses, but a few of those morbidly viruses can switch and change to different species. Okay. Um, the vaccine that we use for dogs and cats is actually the same vaccine that we use for the rubella me measles vaccine, since measles is also a uh, morbidly human? virus as well. Yes. Okay. So the same part of that vaccine that is in your average canine distemper vaccine is the same thing that's in your measles vaccine in humans. Okay. So the vaccine technology hasn't changed a whole lot between as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. um, morbidly viruses are known for being able to affect almost all cells, muscle cells, fat cells, skin cells, everything. What makes it such a long and a lasting and debilitating disease is when it goes in and it actually starts to affect nerve tissue, mm -hmm. when it gets in there, it is a recognizable enough virus that the rest of the animal's immune response can, can find out where it's at. So let's just say, for example, uh, that same virus has inhabited a muscle cell, a skin cell, and a brain cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, the muscle cell and the skin cell, once they become that viral factory and they kind of explode and they make more viruses spread out into the system, then those are really cool. The fact that your skin can replace itself and your muscle can replace itself. But when it comes to the brain having the same thing, it doesn't. Okay, right. but part of that, that whole breakdown of that cell is part of the animal's immune response as well. So it's not just one individual cell that explodes becoming part of that viral factory, but the immune response around it causes for more inflammation in the okay. cranial tissue. Mm -hmm. So as that brain gets infected, those cells start to get injured and die, and the immune response makes that, that small lesion, which could have been just one cell worth, now 10, 15 cells worth. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes the brain look like spongiform encephalitis under the microscope. Wow. Um, and when you think about it, only 15% of our brain cells, our brain is actually neurons. The other, you know, 85% are helper cells and things like that. So it doesn't take much to harm the wiring. And it also doesn't take much to harm those other helper cells to keep our brains activated. So that's why distemper is always forever. It's always forever. That's why you see a raccoon with distemper will get over the any skin issues or diarrhea or any. Because that. all the other cells can replace and replenish right. themselves. But they but always the brain cells end don't. up crippled and with neuro problems. Nine out of ten, they're going to be neurological. Usually, it's the neurologic issues that are, you know, they're causing long term. You know, if they they go blind, they can lose their hearing. You know, their whole frontal lobe turns to mush at some point in time. You know, they could lose the memory of their favorite first treat or whatever. You yeah. know, it, it affects each one's brain completely differently, or it could just give them this feedback mechanisms where they have what's called the nervous tick disease yeah. that they quantified in dogs. You know, as a, as a, the tick syndrome. Anyway, so. Okay. Um, so I, I hope that helps yeah, in how that works. So, okay, then the other one would be parvo, the parvovirus, canine parvovirus. Um, when I was in vet school, I was taught that parvovirus was an enveloped, fax, an enveloped virus. In other words, it, it had its guts and on the, were inside the virus, and on the outside was this icosahedral covering that meant that it could last a long, long time in nature. Now, I understand that science is saying that it's no longer the true enveloped virus that we thought it was, but I'm, somewhere there, I'm sure it's in between those two is going to be the truth. Yeah. Anyway, what's really cool about it being partially enveloped, or it used to be enveloped when I was in school, <laughs> is the sun can be beating down on it. Uh, sun's radiation, hot, cold, all these things would not denature that virus for at least two years in nature. So in other words, if I threw a handful of parvo right here on the ground, 
because it is so resistant to nature and so forth, it would it would still be there infecting animals and you know for the next yeah. two years. So it's it's really neat and unique in that way. It's been cultured off the bottom of the ocean, the middle of the wow. desert. I think they found it on every continent. So I always think of parvo as being godlike. You it's know, universal. if they were yeah, it's everywhere. It's it, so and when you think about it the way viruses have their, their DNA sequence, the same parvovirus that is here would share almost the exact DNA sequence as that found on the opposite side of the globe. Yeah. So it's everywhere. There's no way to truly beat it. And it's in the ground. It's in the ground. I, I tell my clients all the time, it's probably in your fingernails, in your hair, bottom of your shoes. You know, when you walk, it gets there. Right. The thing is, when you, when we think about it, the, not every animal comes down with the disease. Mm -hmm. So for we, we think that and, and, and viral particles, when it comes to disease, there's a number of viral particles that need to get in your system that can overwhelm your immune response where you actually catch that disease process mm -hmm. or your body deals with it. In theory, we're almost always catching parvo, but our immune, resist, our immune system reacts to it, recognizes it, and then we never see clinical signs. Okay, because it's always there. At some yeah. point in time, it's, it's always, it's just one of the things that we deal with. Um, when it comes to, to our individual patients, there's no true way to isolate them from inside because again, it's everywhere. Right. You know, you can try to lower the amount of viral particles that are in your environment, which most people do, but by the time they've walked outside, walked back inside, right, unless they're doing biohazard training, the virus always makes its way in. It might just not be enough of a dose to make the animal safe. So you can take a bath a hundred times a day, but every time you go out- It really takes something like a very strong bleach solution to right. actually kill the virus and, and you know, denature it. So ba bathing won't do anything. You'll right. wash a lot of those particles down the drain, you know, but for the most part, the second you walk out, in theory, it's everywhere. It is. You know, it the is wind everywhere. is blowing, the trees, you know, there are animals in the trees that are shedding it. So I, I really, I, I, I just don't believe there's a way to truly prevent it, okay, right. um, when it comes to our husbandry and that type of thing. Right. Um, right. Every animal that is born um, has some limited immunity to it or none, mm -hmm. okay. It all, again, if an animal who is completely vaccinated from parvo can still come across the stuff on that one piece of land where there's enough viral particles to overcome their immune response. The right. good news is that animal may only suffer from a day of, of diarrhea or two days of diarrhea before their immune response recognizes it and then kicks its butt. Yeah. Okay. Then so okay. even then, a vaccine animal can still catch parvo. Yeah. And the vaccines we used were not designed for raccoons. They were designed for Well, they cats. were they were studied in a lot of species. Okay. They weren't trying to make money in in raccoons and bears and that type of thing since we're going to pick on raccoons and our, our procyanids um they weren't they weren't studied in them okay so but they do know how they affect them and there have been some studies on how it works but when it comes to getting an approval from the fda they have to go through a a challenge study in whatever species they hope to make money and label it in mm -hmm. and it costs millions of dollars to have that done in any one vaccine one in any one species wow. so most manufacturers just don't test it that far yeah. okay. um and even and uh, i we recent all right i guess i was gonna wait to the next question all right go ahead ask some more um just wondering how all right us as rehabbers with raccoons how it's spread i've heard it spread through the air i've heard it spread through the ground through water i just want to um like when we're quarantining the raccoons um up off the ground okay um and and bleaching for cleaning the cages I guess is the best way to do it. And it is. Cleaning our hands often and stuff, but like you're saying, there's nothing we can really do to stop it if we're going back out and coming in resting all the time. So I mean you, it's it's coming back in with you. It might not be at a, a dose or a, a viral right. dose big enough to make an animal sick, but we need to assume that it's always there. Right. I think the second that we stop making that assumption is the second that there's going to be that one case or handful of cases that die suddenly for whatever reason yeah. and you've taken every precaution right. but it's you know it, you it's know. a virus it's got a will to okay. live just like the the animals that we're treating does right it's alive too okay so talk about vaccines our vaccine protocol okay um best way to do this my my general thought across the board is when if mom and dad are of healthy healthy animals be them raccoons dogs cats bears whatever yeah if they're healthy enough and they've been exposed to parvo throughout their lifetime then they're transmitting those antibodies to the young through milk and right. through you know exposure and when she cleans them up and so forth she's you know there's there's just all this sharing of the microbiome between mom and babies as well as through the milk giving those antibodies 
So as long as they're getting that from a healthy mom and dad, in theory, most of these, these things that we're trying to fight and vaccinate against should be pretty covered. Yeah. Okay? Um, but there will be those times when mom and dad won't be, or there are slightly differences in the virus, or if they're around a place where there's a lot of, been a lot of animals in the past, mm -hmm. hospitals, rehab units, wherever, there's going to be a larger dose of parvo in those soils than there would be elsewhere. In other words, if I was to quantify the amount of parvo on this property right here, and then go a quarter mile down the road, it's it could be, be 10 high. times higher a dose here than there would be somewhere right. else. And also transferring from rehabber to rehabber. Yes. Um, cages, that type of thing. You know, a lot of us, we, we do clean our cages pretty regularly, but we don't right. bleach all the time. And it's, it's right. hard for us trying to maintain nature to put that many chemicals out on a regular basis. So we're, we're kind of riding that, you know, that, that fine line between what we can actually kill and what we, you know, what we should be killing. So it's, safe to say that if it healthy parents in the environment say mom gets killed and the baby's are two months old they, they've got a little bit of an immune system from her already. they have some unfortunately have some. the immune response in your average mammal that's going to be an adult in about a year um, physically speaking their immune response is formed enough to fight off most things most things between four and six months okay um so mom will feed them for at least six to eight weeks on the average or less than that depending on some species and what will happen is she gives them enough to then allow their own immune response to back up. What we do as veterinarians and as, as people who have our own pets is they come to us, and I usually recommend this, my, my recommendation across the board, as soon as they're weaned, okay, and the weaning's taken away from mom or, or whatever, at that point in time, we can assume there's no more antibodies making it to those babies at that point in time. So we should start vaccinating the second we get them, okay, with an age or size appropriate vaccine and species appropriate vaccine, and then every two to three weeks three well, three to four okay and yeah. until they're 16 weeks of age and at that point in time they sh their immune response should be strong enough to to battle off most of what we're going to throw at it so okay. do you suggest like you do with puppies and kittens six weeks nine weeks 12 weeks and then 16 weeks do right but we always before? base that on when you know i like to start basing that number as to when they were weaned when, when they, they were, were off weaned. mom or stopped getting mother's milk specifically right. Because we may get a raccoon yeah. that's two or three days old, or, or some other at that point in time. We, it, you know, at that point in time, once we're giving them artificial milk, okay, mm -hmm. something that was made artificially, then we should probably be giving them a vaccine series every three to four weeks until 16 weeks of age. Starting at that age, even at a young age. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about <clears throat> we got canine and feline for the raccoons? Should they have both? Should they get them at the same time? How should we give that to them safely? Okay. Right now, in, in veterinary medicine, or hell, across all of medicine right now, vaccines are quite controversial, okay? It, it turns out that vaccines are, are meant to challenge an immune response, okay? Um, they're meant to teach an immune response what we're trying to help it fight. Unfortunately, those viruses go through mutations. Um, yes. We're due for another parvo strain any day now that's, yeah. you know, because they've got A, B, C, D, and, and a few of the letters after that, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, the point is, is they, they modify, so the vaccines can modify too. But when you're giving them this disease, okay, that's what a vaccine is, right. you're giving them a limited virus or something that's dead so their body could go in and say, ah, these antibodies can learn how to fight this, mm -hmm. okay, and then once that's done, then hopefully their body will remember that forever and always, yeah. okay, but some animals might not have those, uh, can be born without those processes. Mm -hmm. Some animals may be completely in a, incapable of mounting an immune response against the uh, distemper or parvo or any of the things we try to vaccinate against including rabies okay yeah. this, this, there are definitely documented cases of people out there that have had similar issues as well as animals so anyway back to what you're trying to say yeah right now so giving too many vaccines at one point in time is always going to be a stressor for a body and when we came down to your five or seven and one which you usually find on your usual dog vaccines mm -hmm. that's probably the max that you'll ever want to give and even then, a lot of the new vaccine recommendations are if that animal is less than five pounds, to give half the dose. Half the dose. Yeah. Okay. So again, if you're looking at a raccoon who's just a few weeks old, is less than five pounds, giving it a dog vaccine by itself, or the, your usual dog vaccines that we give, is going to cause them a little bit more stress mm -hmm. than a raccoon because we're giving them things their body wouldn't ordinarily think of as right. bad. Okay. Right. Um, and with that in mind, they may completely have already worked evolutionary speaking through that whole process of getting over it uh, yeah. you know mounting mounting that immune response so we give those seven things and then somebody comes on the same day and gives the cat vaccine which you know the five to seven and one right. and in doing so 
you've given twice as much as any any animal can ordinarily get through. Right. And if you're not lowering that dose to begin with, you know, to half that dose, then you're overloading. Especially an orphan that has not had any immunity from Ma, say that we got it three days old, if we're, you know, it's even worse. It just seems like it would make them sicker. It would, it would definitely push them over the edge. It could so, very definitely push them over the edge. Okay. Especially if one's compromised or... And when you think about it, the, the, the feline parvo vaccine and the canine parvo vaccine, they're different, okay, but they're still parvoviruses. Right. And to teach, you know, to sit there and over, overcome a system, you know, a, a small animal's immune response with two different types of virus or two, the vaccine that works in two separate ways, mm -hmm. then parvo could be the reason for its death very simply. So it's, it's uh, distemper, or which one is camels or females? One of them in a cat is the same as distemper in a dog? Um, yeah. And, uh, so Still a more belly, more belly virus, yeah. Right. So okay, so okay, good. That makes sense. Now, the only other thing I wanted to ask about was the is the Vibrio. When we're giving our animals fish and stuff like that that we rotted in the ground, is it Vibrio that they get from that? Um, they can get Vibrio from just about anywhere. Almost okay. every ditch, every poor water so source in all of Mississippi and throughout the country is going to have Vibrio in it. Vibrio is that layman's term for highly motile, mostly gram-negative organisms. There can be Vibrio that are gram-positive as well. Okay, mm -hmm. and my point is, is they're usually, when you see them under the microscope in a, in a live situation, they're just usually swimming around mm -hmm. and moving. I, uh, I usually, when I have to show a client this, I usually say these are bouncing off your dog or your cat's intestinal walls, and that's going to cause some enteritis and some diarrhea. Um, Vibrio also produce certain toxins that one can melt flesh. Mm. Uh, there is even a, a, a nerve issue or a, a neurologic issue, um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Mm. In humans, is, they're trying to link it, or they wow. were trying to study a few years ago, trying to link it to, to uh, Campylobacter or Vibrio in general. Campylobacter jejuno has a Vibrio. Um, there are a lot of species of Vibrio. Wow. So as far as us saying that it's only gonna be found in one place or the other, it's it's not going to be that simple. So okay, it's pretty much. Easy. And the fish thing, I you know, vibrio is definitely a fish recognized disease. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, whenever I get a chance to do a fish case or you know some saltwater fish case, I'll almost always see some vibrio. We'll treat for it, but there are probably other disease processes in that tank at the same time. Okay. But you know, the vibrio that we're blaming that we're blaming on this is probably more of a water quality issue. Water quality. Okay. Um, I want to talk about deworming. Okay. Intestinal parasites. Um, uh, we have Panicure and Stronger. This is basically what we use. So, okay. what what is best for what? Um, your your Stronger is really good at hooks and roundworms. Okay. okay. It turns out the Panicure is like a step above, and it not only covers your hooks and roundworms, it also covers whipworms and other species a little bit more resistant uh, um, hookworms and stuff. So, and the whipworms are the one thing that we find that are difficult to treat on a regular basis. So I like Panicure across the board. I've even used it to treat um, uh, protozoal infections and snakes and frogs and other species. I've used it actually for protozoal enteritis and a few dogs and cats and other mammals too if I think that, that flagell or those other drugs might be too rough on their system. Okay. So I'm a big fan of Panicure. Yeah, I am too. So three days of that? Um, three days, it all depends. If we're treating a protozoal enteritis, I'd have them on it once a day for the next five to seven days. If we're just trying to go for wearing, I would definitely do one to three days from the species. Your cats, one day might be enough. Your dogs might need three days. But the bad thing is most of these worms have what's called a pre-patent period where um, hookworms, for example, you, you can actually deworm them today and to this afternoon they'll be out there barefoot and they'll step in one of their old pieces of poop where some of the worms were again. They'll get reinfected and up to se or as early as seven days later, you can actually find worms again in the stool. Wow where they're actually doing. So you want to treat them, you know, not just for three days, but another week another afterwards, week. and probably even another week, depending on the species okay. and the parasite. That makes sense. But for a protocol, for say, we, we always deworm the minute they come in. They get warmer in their mouth, okay. no matter what. We don't even look under the microscope. We just want to, so intake of baby raccoons anywhere from a week to two months old. Raccoons. Raccoons and your procyanids, I would recommend deworming weekly, at, at least, you know, once a week for the first the two to three weeks mm -hmm. and after that I would say maybe every other week okay. because they carry parasites that are known to kill you guys yes. um, Bellus ascaris for example mm -hmm. I would really like to see us try to protect ourselves as well as the raccoons right you know so you Absolutely. know make sure your doctor knows that you're you're treating these species mm -hmm. he'll probably give you a script for some dewormer as well yeah. 
just to make sure it's preventative in you or, you know, I myself take the pain to cure myself on occasion. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> so um, should we hit them with both? Wormers then when they come in, would you suggest for raccoons to hit them with the Panicure and Strongit or just Panicure does the work of both. So we can just go strictly with Panicure that goes. Okay. Um, Strongit tastes better. So it if you're... does because that's yeah I drink it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think that's pretty much all I really wanted to go over was the main diseases we see: the vaccines we use, the deworming. Um, I think that's it. Do you have any? Oh, you know what I want to talk to you about was antibiotics. Okay. Um, for basic stuff that we see in raccoons, be it, you know, an injury, um, an abscess, you know, from a fight or something, when we get one in, uh, best course of treatment for different type of infections, um, uh, upper respiratory, what would be best for that? Believe it or not, I like to start off with the easy things for starts. Um, usually, if we get them in and they're scratched up, then a penicillin will usually do well for a lot of those lesions. When it comes to deeper lesions or an abscess, amoxicillin is actually not a bad choice as well. Okay. Every, every infection is caused by a bacteria, okay, or a fungal disease or something that's causing that infection. It, in a perfect world, doing a culture, sending it off, having it come back and then tell us it's this organism so that can tell us possibly how they got it and how long and what the complications are. But seeing as how no one has that culture capability and it gets kind of expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah, even to send off a culture to your average vet these days is mm -hmm. hundred plus bucks. Right. So anyway, with that in mind, I we could hit them off with some of the safer antibiotics. It turns out most of our mammals, especially our omnivores and our carnivores, Amoxicillin is really a good choice. It doesn't have too many other side effects. Right. Um, if you're using it in a squirrel or a rat or a rabbit, those things can actually cause some severe diarrhea because not those use guys use more bacteria to digest their food yeah. than than not. So, you know. But when it comes to your possums, your raccoons, amoxicillin is probably one of the easiest, cheapest, and, and Best things to one use. For it. What about upper respiratory? Um, it should actually help for there as well. When okay. it comes down to upper respiratory tract infections. Um, our experience here on the coast is we'll almost always start off with an amoxicillin. After that, we may go for a sulfa drug because it's got a different mechanism of action. And of course, after that, we may go for something like doxycycline, one of your bacterial static type antibiotics. Those are the three main ones that are relatively easy to get, inexpensive, and, uh, and cover at least Covers three basic um, pathways of action for the antibiotic. Okay. Now, neurologically speaking, sometimes I get raccoons in that have been hit by a car, bump their head, whatever. Um, best course of action for something that you know has just got a concussion, something that's gonna recover from, not something that's suffering from distemper, leftovers, you can't help that. But if concussion, if you get one in the dexamethasone, prednisone, what's the best course of action uh, for that? Dexamethasone, um, how do I put this? Dexamethasone is ordinarily a little faster acting and shorter acting, mm -hmm. but it's, it's like giving a good mood and a shot. Okay, when you right. think about it, once you're sitting there, you're laying there and you're painful, getting a shot of Dex is like, oh God, the stress just went away. I still hurt, but oh my God, the, you know, the anxiety is gone for a little bit. Yeah. You know, it doesn't kill all the pain, but it definitely reduces the inflammation. So I would start with a Dex injection. Mm -hmm. If you think they're gonna be on uh, corticosteroids for length of time, I would get the appropriate dose of the species and then start them on Pred after that. Okay. That should be enough. Yeah. Um, if you're gonna use Dex or if that's all you've got, I usually don't recommend using it any more than three days in a row. Right because it turns out that it's also very, uh, quite complicated, but it can actually cause gastric ulcers and other GI issues. Okay, okay now hydrating. One of the main things we run into is dehydration. And we usually will sub Q fluids. Okay. Um, not, uh, we use uh, lactator bringers. All right, good choice. Um, we will do the Pedialyte and uh, you know, just push fluids for a few days. Do, because we can't do the IV. Obviously. I mean, yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's one thing to one set one in a wild animal, but then to maintain one and monitor it is going to be kind of hard. So you're not the first person to sit there and go, that's not a really good idea. Yeah, no. Especially a raccoon that's angry, you know, it's not going to happen. So um, I want to talk about what happens if you can, and I know you can, to an animal when it's dehydrated. And the fact that a lot of people want to take the animal and immediately start feeding it. Um, food instead of, you know, okay. you know what I'm saying? What does dehydration actually do to the animal and, and how do we, um, how do we address that before anything else? Dehydration will eventually cause hypovolemic shock where there's not enough fluid in the body, their veins start to close, their blood won't move through as well through the veins as it needs to. 
So it will kill them eventually, okay, mm -hmm. if the right things are going. Um, giving them fluid is really important. Subcube fluid, sub -Q, sub -Q fluids <laughs> should not be so difficult to say and or give. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I, I recommend them on a regular basis. And the good news is when it comes to sub -Q fluids, you don't have to worry about so much about dosing. If, right. say, for example, you've got a small three-pound creature and you decide to give him a, that, that fluid bolus that's about a third its size, if you put that into his veins, you may you know, dilute out his blood supply so well that it actually dies of an anemia right in front of you. Right. It can actually happen if it wants to fill up with fluid. But giving it sub-Q means they're going to absorb that bolus over a period of time, right. and the side effects are usually very, very nil. Um, when it comes to digesting food, it requires a lot of fluid to digest food. So if an animal's coming in and it's starving and it's dehydrated, to put food in the stomach means you're going to tell your body to put more of its water into that stomach and into making the, the stomach acid and everything else. So you could actually cause them to be more dehydrated by putting food right. on a dehydrated anim animal's stomach. So don't, yeah, it pulls the off their extremities and everything to get to the stomach. It's just well, I mean, think of it as your your blood supply is basically just one continuous tube throughout your entire body. And if you're trying to put fluid right there to digest food, because mm -hmm. if your body doesn't, then that food can stay in there and rot. So millions of years of evolution have said once something's in there, that becomes a priority. That's why whenever you sleep, Absolutely. you want to feel sleep. You remember, you eat too much, you want to feel sleepy and you mm -hmm. need to have, go have that, tur that post-turkey coma. Yeah. You know, it's not just a tryptophan. It's the way our bodies are wired. Okay. Um, so... You know, I, 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 people feeding them immediately after the type of an accident like that is not a good idea. Uh, even when a baby comes in, some baby squirrel's falling out of a tree and it's dehydrated, we're not, that first feeding should be more aimed at getting rid of the dehydration than opposed to actually giving it nutrition. Right. Okay. Right. Um, now, again, at that age, nutrition is pretty much fluid, but still putting in, giving them that, that bolus in their stomach of, of a stomach full of fluid mm -hmm. and some stuff, sub -key fluids, food can come after that pretty easily. Okay. And in your LRS, there, there are some electrolytes and things to help maintain it. And you can actually add glucose to the stuff that's in the stomach if you need to. Right. What about the sodium chloride and taking away swelling in the brain? Does that help to sub -Q that if you get a head injury? Would that um, actually help? Well, it's a physiological saline. So it's meant to be the same salt solution that's in your veins, which is why you can actually put that in your IV. So as to it actually helping, you know, if, you, if that animal is dehydrated at the same time and you're giving it that fluid, that fluid's gonna maintain and go throughout the body. So if you're swelling in the brain cavity, when you give that sub fluids, that fluid's just gonna pump up that much more okay. inside a, a set brain case, which means it can actually make it worse. Okay. When it comes to brain injuries and trying to get them to, to dehydrate or, or get rid of fluid, we use things like mannitol, which is a salt um, that we put in the veins, and because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, it brings fluid Pulls out of the out. brain into the, you know, into your veins, okay. and that's how it that helps that way. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, I, that's all I can think of. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, um, I mean, I, you know, we're still waiting on the results from those raccoons that have come in. Mm -hmm. You know, but right now our theory is we just gave too many vaccines at one time at too high a dose. You know, somewhere on the line, we have to keep the individual in mind, mm -hmm. and and also at the same time, you know, while we're mm -hmm. on, on a completely different topic, I have, uh, I think we as rehabbers tend to want to save everything, mm -hmm. and I'm not really against that point. What I am against is I want to make sure that what we save is going to be better for the rest of the species. Absolutely. Okay. For example, looking at dogs now. Okay, 10, 15 years ago. Flea allergic dermatitis was our big thing. If we could kill fleas on a regular basis, then every veterinarian was was making their, their student loan payments and yeah, building payments right. in the whole routine. Now we've done so much to the, 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 the canine DNA and genome that some of these breeds can no longer breed themselves. Some cannot survive for more than a week without the vaccines that we've given. Um, you know, the parasites are becoming resistant to a lot of the medications that we're using. You know, so whenever we're trying, you know, and if we're going to have an animal that we're trying to set free, we want to make sure that it's something that's going to strengthen that species outside of our gates and outside of our care. Absolutely. And uh, and I just think a lot of times, a lot of us will will miss that point. You know, we want to save it because you become attached to it, but at the same time, if it doesn't cross that right. that barrier, if it's not going to increase that species, excuse me, longevity long term, yeah. then we probably are causing more harm to the yeah. environment than we are saving that individual. Because our jobs as rehabbers is to get them back out there, and we want to put out healthy animals. Like you say, it's been 
help the species, not uh, make it worse. Or so, yeah. Sometimes euthanasia is the kindest thing um, you can do. Um, I know it's and again, hard. if you stop and you 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 and if you judge that individual's health versus the health of the other thousand animals that are not there. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes making sure that this guy is pain free and gets to go meet Jesus yeah. means the other guys are going to be healthier long term. Absolutely. You know, putting a female out there who's been, who's been through distemper, mm -hmm. you know, and is showing some clinical signs, um, if she's standing for for breeding, is she standing for breeding because she's just too brain dead to know the difference, and exactly. these guys just like her this time of you know this time of year, yeah. you know, you got to ask yourself what exactly is going on there, and if she's going to continue. Is she really continuing with a part of her genome that's more susceptible to distemper? Exactly. Or less susceptible? And you're never going to know because you put her back out there. So. But um, the energy the guys are putting into her or energy that the other females are not going to get, you know. Right. That's all go take care of yeah. the retarded girl in the corner and <laughs> forget she's about just, forget about the girls that are begging there. for attention somewhere. <laughs> she's just laying there and they're working, bringing home I the I probably bacon. shouldn't have gone there, but you get the idea. Get we're we're just trying to strengthen the species we and do. everything we do should be aimed in that direction. Yeah. You know, dogs are no longer the same species they were 30 yeah. or 40 years I ago. I think anything is. It seems like everything's evolved. Even humans. God, think about it. You know, right now... Any stressor between our ears has got I us mean, going your to doctors. Horns right now are starting to come out. Oh, they're sorry. <laughs> Just I mean, the, the amount of uh, of hypersensitivity and allergies these days, you know, yeah. in species, in our species, is just above above. It's above board. It's crazy. It is. Um, okay. The last thing I really want to talk about is rabies. We don't. We haven't seen it in raccoons. Okay. It's out there. I don't know. I don't think it's in our state, or if it is. Well, we haven't I, run across it yet. right now. We haven't seen it in raccoons in the classic form. No. You know, I, I read some articles recently, and I've, I haven't followed up on this. That there is a new species or a new um, lineage of rabies mm -hmm. that does affect raccoons. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it doesn't show the same classic clinical signs. Matter of fact, me being you know not knowing how that actually works and exactly what it is, sometimes I've asked myself every time I see a distemper patient, is could this be that case? Yes. You know. Could this be what we're seeing? Um, but right now, there's really no test that they can they can do to make that difference. So I'm not sure. But I will say, you know, we've had a few cases of rabies here in Mississippi, but the, all of the recent cases have been brought in from across state lines. Mm -hmm. Were found before before there came an issue, and before that, we haven't seen it in this area since the 30s, yeah. 30s or 50s. I, mean, I want to say I'll say 50s just to be safe. Okay. But. So we're pretty safe on that for now. Yeah. But we're watching it. Um, Gosh, back in you know 10 years ago. Mississippi was one of the few states that used a three-year vaccine every year. Right. You know, and, and I'd like to think that's one of the reasons we've not seen it in so long. Yeah. You know, now that we've laxed up on the vaccine protocols, we've actually had, you know, three or three or four cases come into the state, again, that came from outside. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just, I wonder if that's ever going to come back and, and, uh, and bite us in the butt. Yeah, you never know. And now, um, rabies in general. Bats carry rabies. Is it the same type of rabies? Is it different strains? Like a bat bites a raccoon, bites a human. Is They're that how it works? Pretty much the same strain. Okay, so skunk, bat, raccoon doesn't matter. So, so we've been pretty lucky there in our wild life we have um, so far. So, okay. Mississippi's a tough place. I mean, yeah. you know, when you think about it as far as wildlife goes, the weather might not be crazy here, but there are fungal diseases out there in the bushes and water sources and tons of Vibrio. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't even get near the beach without seeing a sign about Vibrio. Right. You know, so there's is, this is a, water. It's a pretty tough place to live, you know, for wildlife as well as for humans. So, they, you know, rabies, I'm sure it might be out there somewhere, but we're probably not going to see those cases because it, they would have died from other things before they got here. Right. That makes sense. Okay. I think that's it. Now you'll think of something else. You, you, know, you've not failed us so far. Um, <laughs> uh, no, that's really all I can think. The major issues we deal with with raccoons. Um, um, speaking of rabies, getting uh, vaccinated ourselves. The human vaccine is an intradermal. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's this tiny little needle with some reddish fluid in it, and it can just put it into the skin. And then once you get it, your arm is going to be numb for a while or be painful. It all depends on how your body responds to it. Um, I have probably been vaccinated a hundred other times in veterinary medicine from some dog that didn't want the rabies vaccine. I got yep. stuck accidentally. <laughs> so I've gotten both. I guess I'm pretty protected. But 
the if you're going to be a wildlife rehabber, if you're going to be around animals at all that are wildlife and even you know a lot of domestic animals outside of the state specifically, yeah. then I would definitely recommend a rabies vaccine. And it's a serious. It's cheaper to get it before than after. I yes. Oh hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know your your Free vaccine exposure. before is going to be four hundred bucks depending on who gets it for you and what they charge you to put it in. But when you're going through rabies treatment, it's like twenty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not cheap. And, and that's and a bunch of shots as opposed to just scary. one. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what is the difference between what you vaccinate a dog with and a human? That vaccine. That vaccine, I know, is quite different, but I am not going to sure. baffle you, can't you with. Do yeah, that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to baffle okay. you with the bullshit. I, but I, it is I know different. that they're different because they're the one. It's the way it's introduced, um, as far as this dose wise goes. But I'm pretty sure it's the same antigen. Okay. Okay. So, but there are places all over the coast we can go to get these vaccines. Pre Usually, if you go to your usual doctor or your guy's favorite medic, you know, medical they specialist, it. they can order it and get it in. Okay. Like I said, it's a small intradermal vaccine. Um, and I had it back in 96. You know, do you get the titers check? Do you have to do that? Um, I, I should, it's but I have not. Because I keep getting dog vaccines. You, you, you know. keep doing yourself. Yeah. So. Okay. It's, and I'm not doing it myself. Not trust me. I don't, I don't like yourself, needles that much, but... but <laughs> You actually like but I do get yourself. scratched every now and then from some dog that don't give me a shot. <laughs> you want oh, me to give gosh. him a shot? There you go. Yeah. Uh, okay, that just reminded me of uh, one of the veterinarians I worked for that had stuck a needle, stuck a cap on, was about to give a dog a shot to bring him some hormone, and mm -hmm. he stuck himself in the booty. Ah. It was very funny. <laughs> um, I remember that. <laughs> so, okay, seriously, that's all. I, I think I just want to hit the major topics that we're dealing with in raccoons. Um, that we see coming in every day, um, injuries and stuff like that. Medicines we use to treat them and um, vaccinate them. So, and we don't do the rabies vaccine in raccoons here. No, if you were, if rabies were a bigger issue in Mississippi, we probably would be putting out the rabies baits mm -hmm. and things so like that. It really isn't an issue right now. No. Yeah, so we're not going to panic. The Food Drug Administration, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, will let us know when it's done. And they watch that stuff. Yes, they, they watch, watch it very closely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up? Um. No. We talked about uh, strengthening the genome, um, keeping animals longer than we need to, and uh, I can't think of anything else right offhand. I can't either. I'm sure I'll think of something later. <laughs> so, but we can talk about that when we play this out at the training. We'll, okay. We'll play this, and um, and if people come up with more questions, we'll get them to write down, and we'll maybe we'll do a second one of these. Okay. At some point, but um, the baby season's coming up in a few months, so we want to be ready for that yeah. um, medically too. Um, so I'm going to, and I was hoping you could be there because I want to do a class with bandaging, proper bandaging techniques, giving the shots, everything, um, and do a clinic where it's hands-on, you know, okay. with some of these younger raccoons we've got in, I've got, you know. Although I'm all for that, I find that a lot of times, I how do I put this, being a veterinarian, if you've ever listened to my voicemail, you know, there's a thousand things on there that almost everybody is guilty of at some point in time with some patient. They looked on, you know, Google, yeah. they've, they've looked up some treatment, yeah. they've got a broken leg and a bandage, and they tend to bypass the medical, you know, the medical professionals more than they should, mm -hmm. and that happens everywhere, oh, yes. you know. So I, I'm usually kind of leery about making sure, make sure the kind of knowledge that we're giving them. Right. Because the second somebody sees a leg, you know, splinted, they're like, oh my God, I can do this for the rest no, of no. my life yeah, now. we don't want to do that. And unfortunately, there are a lot of other things to keep in mind. There's a compound. Is it commonated? Right. You know, does it need external fixators? Does it need antibiotics because of an open open wound? Right. And you can't put an open wound inside of a splint. So, you know, right. I'm, I'm all about teaching a lot of that stuff. I just, I, I really think that through. we, you know, this coast needs a wildlife hospital. It does. You know, a place yeah. where everybody can just bring in their patients and have it looked at really quick. They and, do, because we, we can't see inside of them. And, and we can all day long, you know, do this, but we don't know what the break is for real. We don't know. We yeah. don't know. And, but just to, even to stabilize a patient so we can get to you, um, kind of something like that, how to um, wrap a bleeding wound keep it from bleeding out so we get to a bed or something like that okay. but, um, for the rehabbers to be able to give their own vaccines that kind of thing because um, a lot of
lot of new people come on board. Um, administering medicines, even how to show them how to sub Q properly. Just, you know, I am versus sub Q, that kind of stuff. Um, I would like to have a little class like that. All right, we'll make it work. Basic medical hands-on stuff. It's best done during baby season, I think, because you're not dealing with an adult raccoon. It's trying to kill you, <laughs> so you've got a, a well-handled baby um, that the, the new rehabbers can handle without getting bit, you know, and, and actually do hands-on. Simple stuff. But no, I would never suggest that we think we can wrap a fracture and go. Um, You'd be surprised how often it's done. But I, I prefer we know how to stabilize properly to get to the bed. You know what I'm saying? Stop this bleeding so we can get there from stitches. Or whatever. We'll make that happen. Okay. So that'll be coming up maybe during the spring. We'll do a class on that during baby season. And you have any questions? No?